I was asked to write it <laughs> by the publisher with a good deal of money uh, extended. Uh, they wanted something in which there was a controversy that uh, uh, wasn't well known. And I didn't think the Compromise of 1850 was well known. In fact, I've learned that Americans hardly know very much of their own history. Uh, college students know that there was a civil war, but when it happened, they have no idea. So I thought this would be a fitting time to talk about a compromise because it really did save the Union for 10 years. And in that 10 years, the North further industrialized itself so that it could uh, put an army in the field and keep it there, which the, the South couldn't do. The South was very militarily uh, directed. And in 1850, I really think if they had seceded, they would have made good their independence, which would have been a disaster for us. Because once you break the Union, you can break it again and again. And Clay came forward with this compromise, and it did hold the Union together for 10, year, ten years. That's a long time for the North not only to industrialize itself, strengthen its industries, uh, uh, have better railroads and factories, but it gave them time to find Abraham Lincoln. They didn't have any real leaders. Buchanan, Pierce, Taylor, none of them had the vision that this man had. And one last point. Point. Absolutely. Uh, when it did come, secession and civil war, which they knew would be a consequence, and uh, 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 Lincoln was there to put the Union back together, a, a, a Southern Histor uh, uh, the senator said, if Henry Clay had been alive in 1860, there would have been no civil war. He was, somehow would have found a, a means of preventing it. And that's a nice thought to, to it's, have. It, it's, a, it's, it's a wonderful thought, and uh, it's, the, uh, it's the theme that drives the book. But let, let's go back and talk about really a tradition of compromises. The Compromise of 1850 is probably the most famous uh, one, but there were others that came first, and in a way, the Constitution itself was the first such compromise, was it it's not? It's a bundle of compromises. There, practically every sentence is a compromise. Whether you're going to have a large state uh, government or a small, whether you're going to have a single legislature or two or more, uh, the powers of the president, the Supreme Court, there will be a Supreme Court and, and such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time establish. What is a, how many men or women justices are going to be on the Supreme Court? It doesn't say. But this is how you get things done, because with any question, you will have somebody who will say, no, it shouldn't be that way. It should be this way. So what you have to do, Henry Clay said, is find something that the opposition wants and grant it to them. At the same time, they have to grant what you want that's important. In other words, there are no losers, there are only winners. Each side gets what it really wants and therefore will agree and actually do something 
helpful to the American people. That's how Social Security was passed. There, were, uh, there was opposition, but there were a lot of people on both sides who, who thought and realized this has to be done. Same thing with Medicare. Look at the Congress today. Unless you compromise, Clay was saying, you cannot govern efficient, efficiently. And, and politics is about governing, and you govern with compromise. I, I find it uh, fascinating the way you, you, you phrase it a number of times, and Henry Clay understood it, that compromise involved some degree of, of, of victory on both sides. So often when you hear people tell the tale of an agreement that was made, they, they, they say, well, it must be a good one because no one's happy. But instead, instead, apparently, one of Henry Clay's insights was, no, you have to make sure that both sides come away to some extent feeling like they won. Mm -hmm. Exactly so. And it, it applies today. That's why when I started writing this book, I recognized that it has a message for the present generation. And I gave copies of this book to a number of congressmen. Uh, and I hope they get the message. <laughs> right, right. It is very hard. If you, as Clay said, if you just shove it down the throats of the opposition because you have the votes, then when they come into power, they're going to shove it right back. Look what will happen with health care if the Republicans take over the Congress or just even the House. They will revise it in such a way that probably Obama would have to veto it. And unless they have a two-third majority, that veto will stand. And they would have to wait until they elect their own president to get the kind of bill that they want. Well, why don't we, why don't we turn to the next precedent for a major compromise. First, we had the Constitution itself. But there was a crisis that was touched off beginning in 1815 when it was uh, the case of Missouri seeking admission as a slave state, provoking a, a major series of events. Can you tell us about that yes, series? Well, again, it is Clay as the Speaker of the House. Indeed, he, he is probably the greatest speaker and uh, uh, the present occupant uh, accepted, of course, uh, in which he brokered a compromise, uh, Missouri was part of the Louisiana Purchase. And so it, it was going to be cut away, and it wanted to come in as a slave state. And the North said, no way. And so the South said, if you refuse that, we're out of here. They were already threatening secession. And as Daniel Webster said, if secession comes, there is war, and it will be bloody. And it was when it finally did come. And so what they did was bring in Missouri as a slave state, but then allow Maine to detach itself from Massachusetts, because it was part of Massachusetts, as a free state. So one and one. And then as far as the Louisiana Purchase was concerned, they drew a line, 3630, and said slavery will be allowed south of that line and prevented and, and kept uh, free north of that line. Again, something for you. And it passed and the Union was held together. And, and it's fascinating to think how, how young a man Henry Clay was at that point. How, 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 how young was he? He was, yeah, he, I he was born in 1777. Right. And so he was very early on I'm not on good scene. at mathematics. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, you know, what, what's 
very interesting is that this man uh, was probably more intelligent, basic brains, more than Thomas Jefferson said one man and James Madison, but he didn't have the education.